When I hear the word of God read, the word becomes plural. However, when I meditate on the word of God, it's single. Let us take a lesson and look at our gospel reading this morning that comes from the gospel of Mark, first chapter, starting at verse 29 through 39. Once again, we shall be reading our gospel lesson from the gospel of Mark, chapter 1, starting at verse 29 through 39, which can be found on page on your pew Bibles, 1553. I shall be reading from the New International Version. The Word of God for the people of God. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So he went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. The fever left her, and she began to wait on them. That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed. The whole town gathered at the door, and Jesus healed many who had various diseases. He also drove out many demons. But, I say again, but he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Very early in the morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they exclaimed, Everyone is looking for you. And Jesus replied, let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. So he traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Let us pray. Dear Father in heaven, as we come to you this morning, Lord God, we pray, allow your spirit to fall afresh upon us. Lord, we know that those who have ears, that they should hear. But more than that, Lord God, I'm asking them to prick some hearts this morning that they may hear the word of God and receive it. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, who you are my strength and my redeemer. And the people of God will say, Amen. Amen. It is just the first chapter of the Gospel of Mark, but we find Jesus is performing miracles dealing with crowds who are clamoring for more miracles, and dealing with disciples who do not yet understand his ministry. Jesus has been overworked and unappreciated, but Jesus withdraws to a deserted place to pray and to review in the whirlwinds of chaos, Jesus finds himself having to reset his focus on what is important, and that's the proclamation of the word. If we will note in 
Mark's gospel is the shortest of the gospel, but it moves at a fast pace. And the gospel characterized the word, the one word, but, immediately is followed. We find ourselves needing to replay this story in slow motion to appreciate the significance of the word but that is found in verse 34b. Just a few verses removed, Simon and Andrew had left their nets to follow Jesus, as did James and John, who left their father. It seems as if these new disciples will continue engaging in the fishing industry. Notice, if you will, Jesus has not told them not to fish, but he said, come after me, and I will make you into fishers for men. But, nor has Jesus persuaded them not to fish, as long as they make the kingdom of God their priority. As long as they make the kingdom of God their priority. The story of the healing of Simon's mother-in-law follows the story of the exorcism in the synagogue of a man who was of unclean spirit. It was Jesus' first act in the ministry, other than changing water to wine and calling the first four disciples. You see, the exorcism takes place on the Sabbath, but the opposition to Jesus has not yet developed, and there is no reaction to his healing and performing exorcism on the Sabbath yet. Let us unplug from a world that seems to be infatuated with this man, this prophet, and this messiah, and plug into the gospel that says more proof is needed of his divinity. Our sermonic title this morning is simply one word, but, but. One may ask, what part of speech is but? It is an adverb that means merely, and also it can modify a verb or an adjective. But it is a conjunction used to link thoughts, which are the same grammatic type, coordinating conjunction, if you will. The word but is used also to connect ideas that may contrast as well. However, the word but in our gospel this morning simply means, if not for God. It's a verb, if not for God. And when you hear the word but this morning, I want you to say to yourself, when I say but, if not for God. But, if not for God. The early reading of the Old Testament this morning would not have come alive. Simon's mother-in-law would not have been healed or there would not have been successful exorcism. We find that there is something healing about the human touch. But the laying of hands, if you will, Jesus was not afraid to touch the untouchables. Touching was a part of his ministry, but we should add a caveat regarding touch as a part of our ministry. It behooves us to be very careful to avoid the touch that could be construed to have sexual overtones or improprieties. Improper touching has led to disaster consequences for pastors, for churches, and the recipients of that improper touch. Yet in our text this morning, Jesus compounds his touching. It is our fifth 
of healing on the Sabbath. Yet, no one is saying anything. Also, as an afterthought, it's quite possible that the servants of Peter, Simon Peter's mother-in-law, will render to the disciple when she gets up, constitute also a violation of the Sabbath law. But, I need to say that Jesus honors women in his ministry this morning in his heteropatriotic society by making a woman the first of his gospel miracles. He will raise Jairus' daughter from the dead and will heal a woman with hemorrhage issues. Presumably, women also among those healed when the whole city encamps around Peter's mother-in-law's door. But we have these three different stories in our text where Mark highlights the healing of women. Why may one ask? Here is why male disciples constantly fail to understand the significance, hearing, of women as disciples, which Mark's gospel portrays them in a better light at the temple. But for a poor widow will give more than anyone. But for a woman who pours costly nard on to Jesus will anoint, will anoint his body for burial. When Jesus is crucified, Peter will deny him, and the other disciples will be nowhere to be found. But for a number of women will be present with him, and but for Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of Jesus and Salome will bring spices to the tomb to anoint Jesus' body. Can anyone else understand the importance of women ministry other than those women who are celebrating this morning, knowing that they too can be disciples of Jesus? Notice in our text, if you will, Jesus not only heals the sick with various diseases, but he casts out many demons. Jesus heals the physical infirmities as well as casts out spiritual infirmities. Jesus does not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. And Jesus silenced not only the demons, but also the beneficiaries of the healing. And even his disciples, he silenced to who his identity was. If he asked me, Jesus would benefit from the display of his divine power of the exorcism and healing. They seek him. His ability to heal draws them. He bears testimony to his great authority, and yet no one is saying anything yet. Yet one would ask, why would he command silence for everyone? <laughs> yes, there are several possibilities, any or all which could be true. People are coming to Jesus for healing and not salvation. People are coming for healing and not salvation. Jesus does not seek the honors from the demons. The demons understand who Jesus is because they are spiritual beings as well. And Jesus identified will not be clear to others underneath until his death and resurrection is made known to the crowds. If people were to identify Jesus as the Messiah at the early stages of his ministry, they would expect him, they would expect him to be fully fulfilled nationalistic with the expectation of organizing an army and taking down the Roman Empire. 
Jesus, however, mouths the ministry on the sermon and the servant motif found in Isaiah 49. But if it was not for God, early in the morning, while it was still dark, he rose up to pray. You would think that Jesus would be tired from his long day of preaching and healing and exorcism, but he gets up while it's still very dark, well before sunrise, and he went out and departed into a deserted place and prayed there. The word deserted is often used to speak of the wilderness in the Old Testament. A wilderness has special meaning to the Jews. It was in the wilderness that God shaped the Israelites, redeemed them, and made them into the people of God. And John the Baptist called people to repent for forgiveness of their sins in the wilderness. It was in the wilderness that Jesus triumphed over Satan's daily temptations. But God often does his best work in the wilderness. This should give us hope as we experience our wilderness moments grow, times when things seem bleak or hopeless to know that God is near and God is present. It could be that God is using our wilderness experience to reshape us, to reshape our lives, to save us from disasters or to make our brokenness whole. The deserted place that Jesus goes to is like a desert, but not in the vicinity of Capernaum. Rather, the place where Jesus goes must be spiritually akin to the desert wilderness, a place where he can be free from distraction, a place where he can give himself unreservedly to prayer, a place where he can find strength from the one in whose service he has come to proclaim. Notice that even Jesus needed to recharge his batteries. But, I say but, the disciples don't understand his need for prayer. You see, everyone is looking for him. Embedded in this statement is a veiled rebuke. We can assume that Simon Peter is the spokesperson here because he usually assumes that role, one, and two, he rebuked Jesus on at least one other occasion because Simon people, Peter thought he was doing what was good. He thought he was doing what was good. But Jesus approaches a different methodology. What Jesus does, he turns good to better. And I can tell you, God will take Jesus better and make it best. Mm. And Jesus says, let's go elsewhere into the next town that I may preach there also because I came for this reason. It's inferred here, but I came for this reason, and Jesus will not let his disciples set his agenda. Woo. You know churches want to set the preacher's agenda all the time, but for God. But for God who keeps Jesus on the straight and narrow path. But there is a message here, bro. For churches today in our success-oriented society, we are frequently tempted to cater to any ministry strategy that pleases people and fill pupils. It is often difficult to discern when that is appropriate and when it's not, but the proclamation of the gospel requires that there be people to hear the word of God. People
people are important. Without the people, the word cannot be proclaimed. But more than that, but Jesus is about his father's business. Shouldn't we be about our father's business? Our message here is a lesson concerning the proclamation of the word. One word, but, this morning, as Christ's church, we are legitimately involved in a host of activities, running food pantries for the hungry, shelters for the homeless, digging wells in primitive villages, counseling couples who are having marital difficulties, praying for the sick, lost and broken of heart, but our core mission is preaching. It's carrying the word of God to each and every person. But for God who makes it all possible, I authentically proclaiming the message of the kingdom is what we are called to do. But if it was not for God, as Larry said this morning, where would we be? Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Eternal loving God, we thank you, Lord, this morning for all those who have contributed to this service. We thank those for whose hearts have been pricked and the word has been received. But more than that, Lord God, we pray that no ear has escaped the word of the proclamation, that when it goes out, Lord God, it goes in such a manner that all will hear, and at some point we know, Lord God, every knee shall bow before you. Now, Lord God, come, have it your way. Turn our good into better, and our better to best for your kingdom.